So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Astrid and I'm happy to welcome you to the Future Studio Discussion Club. Uh, as many of you know, here in Future Studio, we are discussing everything related to the future of Armenia and the world. After the situation with the virus and the global uh, changes over the past few months, we decided to launch a series of uh, the webinars under the umbrella COVID-19, Defined Universal Fear. We will discuss how the virus affects our lives in various aspects and especially healthcare industry. Different experts of healthcare from different countries joined us to help people to deal with fear. This series uh, of webinars will be hosted by Future Studio and powered by Foundation of Armenian Science and Technologies. Today we start our first webinar discussing the most popular myths and facts about COVID-19. Uh, and I want to in introduce our moderator, Doctor of Medicine, Master of Public Health, Senior Innovation Analyst at FAST, and my dear colleague, Christina Akutan. Christina Jan, stage is all yours. Thank you, Astrid, for the introduction. Can you hear me well? Yes, we hear you. Good evening, Dr. Ernst and our dear audience. Thank you for joining us live today. We are very privileged and honored to have a very special speaker with us. Dr. Joel Ernst is a professor of medicine and chief of division of experimental medicine at the University of California in San Francisco, a flagship unit that performs cutting edge research and training on the human immunology of global infectious diseases. Dr. Ernst has paramount experience in the microbiological and immunological aspects of infectious diseases. Dr. Ernst, we could imagine your workload these days. Thank you for taking time to speak with us. Aim of today's webinar is to expand our understanding about the virus, how it's tr transmitted, how we can protect ourselves, what are the treatment options, and what are the common misperceptions about the virus and what is the reality. Events are unfolding with a high speed and the picture changes on a daily basis. Thus, we need to constantly reframe our understanding about the virus and what's, what is happening around us. So the duration of the webinar is going to be one hour. During the first part, Dr. Ernst will give us a general overview of the COVID-19, and then we will have a question answer session. So you are welcome to post questions. We have been receiving many interesting questions from, from our audience just before the webinar as well. Thank you so much for your interest. But due to our limited time, many of great questions will be opted out. So our, our sincere apologies for that. I think this is it for the introduction and I'm passing my virtual mic to Dr. Ernst. Dr. Ernst, please. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm glad that I'm able to be with you today here and hopefully I'll be able to convey useful information, helpful information maybe some comfort, um, and also to discuss some of the concerns, questions, and potential myths that have been circulating and help all of you help the people around you have a better understanding of what we're up against and what we're enduring. So just to begin, I'll give some background information about the disease, the virus, and various aspects of why this is such an important problem and, and how it became such an important problem. And then I'll be happy to take any questions that, that, that you all have. So first of all, the disease is termed COVID-19 and it is caused by the virus called SARS-CoV-2. Now, the reason that it is COVID-19 is it's an abbreviation for coronavirus infectious disease 2019, acknowledging that it actually was first discovered and really became a public health problem in 2019. Obviously, most of the global problem that we're confronting has been during this year. The virus called SARS-CoV-2 is related to the SARS virus that emerged in the early 2000s. SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. And that really described the clinical problem that emerged from that original virus. The CoV-2 means that it is SARS coronavirus number two, 
Um, it's related to the original SARS coronavirus. It's also related to the MERS coronavirus that emerged more recently that was a lesser global public health problem. What we know about SARS-CoV-2 related to those others is that it is closely related genetically, but it has uh, distinctions in its genome sequence that clearly make it different and, and, and identify it as different than either of those two viruses. And that presumably explain some of the ways in which the SARS-CoV-2 disease, COVID-19, differs from what we observed with SARS um, and with MERS. The main point that, that I think we know already is that SARS-CoV-2 is much more transmissible than SARS-1 or MERS were, but is less deadly. It is deadly, there's no question about that, we all know that. But the fraction of people who are infected with SARS-CoV-2 that succumb to it is a smaller fraction than with SARS or with MERS. Um, so as I think everyone knows, the main symptoms of COVID-19, the disease, are respiratory. Some of them are minor. In other words, they can resemble just a, a, a typical upper respiratory infection that we would term a cold. Others are more systemic and more severe with fever, with a cough, with muscle aches, with headache. Um, and then obviously in some people, there is lung involvement. It begins as a viral pneumonia and then can progress to a picture of acute lung injury and severe respiratory failure requiring mechanical ventilation. So that's the spectrum of the disease. Um, the transmission is by two routes and those are by droplet transmission. In other words, large droplets of respiratory secretions and aerosol infection. In other words, very small droplets that can be inhaled deeply into the lungs um, and establish infection there. Because of the transmission through droplets, contaminated surfaces are also a potential source of infection. In other words, if someone's respiratory secretions land on a surface and contaminate that surface, another person can come along, contact that surface, potentially, for example, with their hands, and then touch their face, touch their nose, touch their eye, and transfer the virus and become infected that way. And so the preventive measures that are recommended and in place are really oriented be, uh, the way they are because of those now known routes of infection. Um, I think another thing to be aware of and that I, I've encountered some misunderstanding about, and that is that as far as we know, anyone can experience severe disease. As I'm sure you all know, in the case of influenza, when there is an influenza season each year, or when there are influenza pandemics, it's elderly people, and in some cases, young children, that are the most affected with severe disease and, and um, are most likely to, uh, to die as a consequence. This virus also does cause severe infection concentrated in older people, but it by no means spares young adults. In other words, I think every major city, every major, every country that has been affected by, by COVID-19 has observed that young adults can be victims um, and can succumb to severe infection. So this virus doesn't really respect age barriers. As far as the diagnosis is concerned, I think there are two aspects of diagnosis that are worth um, uh, discussing. First, how do we diagnose acute infection? In other words, how do we detect who is infected and who may be potentially able to capable of, of transmitting the infection? And the method for that depends on polymerase chain reaction assay. In other words, the SARS coronavirus is an RNA virus. And so it's first necessary to reverse transcribe the RNA to cDNA, and then using the polymerase chain reaction to amplify the genetic material. That is how we detect the virus in respiratory secretions at 
the present time, the most sensitive way is a combination of an oral swab and a nasopharyngeal swab. Here in San Francisco, those two are submitted together in viral transport medium, and then virus is extracted from the fibers of those swabs and used in the polymerase chain reaction uh, method. The ability to detect virus and to do that testing has unfortunately been slow in some places. I'm, I regret to say that the United States was slower than some other places in terms of making that assay available. And I think that the unfortunate consequence of that was that there was undetected silent spread in the community that we were unable to know about because of the unavailability of testing. It's improving now, but I think for public health control purposes, we still don't have sufficiently available testing. The other testing that is just now becoming available is testing for antibodies to the virus. In other words, in people who've been exposed and mostly recovered, now there are assays becoming available to detect antibodies present in the blood um, uh, of individuals. And, the, and there are two, I think, major uh, potential uses of that. First is in public health surveillance. In other words, we don't know how many people out there had asymptomatic infection or mildly symptomatic infection and recovered. And in order to plan public health interventions, we need to know how widespread this has been. The second way in which that antibody assay results might be used is to identify individuals, perhaps at the time when physical distancing policies are being relaxed, individuals that might be at the lowest risk of becoming infected. In other words, with a typical infection, somebody who recovers is immune to reinfection with that same agent. Now, viruses and bacteria and other pathogens have means of trying to evade that, those mechanisms of immunity. So far, we don't know too much about SARS-CoV-2 and its, available, its ability to evade immunity. And I think as useful as the antibody tests are going to be, I'm a little bit reserved about whether having a positive antibody test is equivalent to being protected from reinfection. I think that that's something that needs to be studied. I think that we need to be cautious about it. In other words, I think that the presence of antibodies detected by the tests that are becoming available should not be regarded as an absolute measure of, of complete immunity. Um, so then um, with respect to treatment, mild cases are best treated with symptomatic relief. Um, anti-inflammatory agents, fluids, rest, um, the things that we're all familiar with. More severe disease, unfortunately, doesn't have any specific treatment. So the, the, the supportive treatment consists of supplemental oxygen, close monitoring, um, monitoring of, of blood oxygen saturation, and in the case of progression to a severe acute lung injury, then mechanical ventilation. We don't yet have any specific treatments to, um, to provide to patients with severe COVID-19 disease. Um, as you're surely aware, there have been many things discussed in terms of potential treatments. Right now, there is no clear data that says that any of those therapies that are being attempted provide a clear benefit. Um, and some of them, obviously have a risk of severe adverse effects, side effects. So chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine have been widely discussed and, and frankly widely used. These are really used out of desperation. In other words, when we have somebody who is severely ill, as physicians, we want to offer something. And there are data from laboratory experiments in cultured cells that indicate that chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine can inhibit the replication of SARS-CoV-2 in cultured cells. And that is the rationale for giving these drugs to 
um, to patients. In addition, they're inexpensive and, and pretty widely available. But unfortunately, evidence for the clinical benefit is not yet available. And I saw a pre-publication just yesterday from Brazil providing evidence that has supported the concern that people given hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine can have severe heart rhythm um, disturbances, which is a known, known side effect of both of those drugs. Azithromycin combined with chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine has been another um, therapy, therapeutic attempt that has been discussed. And again, there are no clear data from controlled trials that provide convincing evidence that that um, adds any benefit. So there are clinical studies underway. Maybe you've heard of a uh, drug called remdesivir. Remdesivir inhibits the RNA polymerase, the enzyme that copies the genome of SARS-CoV-2. And remdesivir has promising activity in cultured cells. It certainly has a scientific rationale. And so there are widespread clinical trials. There was an open label trial that was published really in advance of publication by the New England Journal of Medicine, I think two days ago, with, it was not a controlled trial, it was an observational trial. And the results showed that there was at least some evidence of a benefit but clearly needs to be studied in a, in a controlled fashion in order to know whether, whether the benefits outweigh the risks. Um, as far as prevention is concerned, and this will be the last topic that I cover um, before starting questions, the measures that work, measures that we're employing are the combination of physical distancing, wearing masks, and encouraging hand washing. Um, the mask policies have been variable and have changed fairly frequently. And I think there are several things to explain about that. The early recommendations with respect to wearing masks in public were based on several things. And, and, and the recommendations were largely that healthy people in the community should not wear masks. The rationale first was that masks are in short supply and should be prioritized for healthcare workers that are exposed to infected patients. The second rationale was the belief that we now know is not correct is that asymptomatic individuals cannot be shedding virus. Now we know that that early belief was incorrect. And so certainly possible for people without symptoms to be the source of infection. And so members of the public may benefit from wearing masks one of two ways. First of all, a person who is symptomatic or asymptomatic and, share, and, and shedding virus, if they wear a mask, their respiratory secretions and droplets and aerosols are less likely to reach the environment. Second, for people who are uninfected, they may be protected partly because of a barrier to droplets. Most of the masks that we have available for use outside of healthcare facilities don't completely stop aerosols. And so they don't provide complete protection. The other benefit of a mask is, is maybe sound a little bit funny, but is a very real one. And that is people who are wearing a mask are much less likely to touch their face and potentially transmit the virus to themselves after their hands have come in contact with a, with a contaminated surface. Um, physical distancing has a similar rationale. In other words, that the transmission of the virus is much more efficient by very close contact. And we know that because the attack rate is higher in households than it is in places where people are in casual contact. Um, and so the six foot physical distancing or two meter physical distancing is, is predicated on that um, knowledge. Um, as far as future prevention is concerned, clearly vaccination and vaccination of a wide, large fraction of the public is going to be the best way of stopping the pandemic. It's not clear that 
the infection transmission to the community will sufficiently provide protection to actually stop the pandemic. So I think I and other scientists firmly believe that widespread vaccination with an effective vaccine, obviously it has to be safe. It has, it has to provide um, durable protection. And I think that that is our best hope for actually ending, not only ending the pandemic, but from preventing COVID-19 from becoming a, a, an endemic disease um, that we have to contend with year round in our communities and in our patients. Um, so there are a lot of vaccine efforts. The WHO, the World Health Organization, actually has a very useful table that lists the various efforts that, are, that they're aware of, and there are over 40. Um, in other words, there are a lot of efforts based on prior experience, in some cases, prior experience in making SARS and MERS vaccines, but in other cases, experience either by industry or by academic scientists, experience with other vaccines or vaccine delivery platforms or vehicles that preliminary evidence suggests should allow the development of a protective immune response to SARS-CoV-2. Every vaccine has to be examined for safety. We can't assume that just because one vaccine using a particular delivery uh, approach was safe, therefore the next one will also be safe. The immune system's complicated. We try to train it to do what we want it to benefit from, but our ability to predict those things is imperfect. And so every vaccine has to be studied for its safety. And that is really the main rate limiting effect. That is why getting a new vaccine available is takes, takes so much time. And so with that, I am happy to take any of questions. I can be happy to clarify any of the points that, that I've made and happy to discuss potential myths and other potential facts. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ernst, for interesting and comprehensive overview of the COVID-19. We can now uh, move to the question answer session. I'm trying to group the questions in a way that we'll, we will first speak about the myths and facts, and then about the disease, its diagnosis, and most importantly, the treatment regi regimens that are currently under consideration. So, one second. Okay. So uh, let us quickly go, go through some myths about coronavirus and to demystify some public perceptions. Uh, so the first question, uh, can regularly rinsing nose with acetylene help to prevent infection with the coronavirus? So that's a very relevant question. And I would like to be encouraging about the value of regular rinsing. However, I think first of all, there's no evidence that it helps. And the second, there is good reason to think that it might not. And the reason is that what we know is that the virus has a protein. Maybe you've seen the pictures. You know, there's the, the thick photos of the coronavirus have these projections, so-called spikes. And the protein that makes those spikes attaches to a protein on our cells. It attaches very rapidly and it attaches very tightly. And so, if in the laboratory, we expose cells with that receptor to coronavirus with that spike protein, if we expose the two together and then try to wash away the virus, we can't wash it off. And so it's pretty unlikely that if we can't wash it off in a laboratory dish, I don't think we can wash it off in, in the nose. That's clear, thank you. So the epidemiology of COVID-19 is rapidly evolving. Uh, we learn about the virus each day. Uh, so uh, we, we have a couple of questions about how long the virus lives on the surfaces. Uh, so there are many publication articles that says that the virus lives on the surfaces, especially on a plastic bags, quite a time. Uh, does this mean we need to disinfect the grocery products? 
even if the virus stays on the surface, for example, plastic band in the refrigerator, does it mean one can get infected from it? Is it possible? I think it's theoretically possible. Um, we don't know what the risk is. What we know is that we can detect viral RNA on many, many surfaces after experimental inoculation. The evidence so far does not give us very much guidance on whether that RNA actually represents infectious virus. I think we have to treat it as a risk. Um, and this is obviously why we encourage surface decontamination and regular hand washing. Um, in terms of handling groceries, um, I think that washing vegetables and fruits is always a good idea. Um, but I think that the other thing to point out is that so far, we don't have any evidence for, and there is evidence against, the possibility that SARS-CoV-2 can be transmitted by the gastrointestinal route. In other words, by eating a contaminated apple, for example. Um, and, and for one thing, there are enzymes and acid in the stomach and digestive tract that should be capable of destroying the virus. The expression of the receptor for SARS-CoV-2 in the gastrointestinal tract is, is low. And so I think there's reason to think that the gastrointestinal route of infection should not be a common one. So um, depending on where you live and depending on how food markets are handling things, um, there is a risk that a person shedding virus could contaminate a plastic wrapper, that sort of thing. My suggestion and what we do here at home for, for our own family is that when we unwrap, if we purchase something that's wrapped like that, when we unwrap it, we toss the wrapper away, we quickly, quickly wash our hands again, and so far so good. Uh, thank you for the for the answer. So next question again about the myths and our misperceptions about the virus and ways we can get it uh, get infected. So uh, can usage of UV lamps help to disinfect surfaces? Uh, and uh, if it does, can uh, high altitude countries that are more exposed to UV expect less cases of COVID-19? So that's also a good question. We do know that ultraviolet irradiation will damage nucleic acids, including viral nucleic acids. And we use ultraviolet irradiation to decontaminate a lot of things in hospitals. Um, for example, my work with tuberculosis, we benefit from actually irradi UV irradiation of the air coming out of the rooms of patients with TB. So we know that ultraviolet radiation in sufficient doses will inactivate many viruses and bacteria, other, other pathogens. It's dose related. What I mean by that is it, the intensity of the ultraviolet radiation and the length of time required for ultraviolet radiation exposure to inactivate pathogens is pretty intense and pretty long. And so I think that sort of home methods of UV irradiation or depending on sunlight to in, including in high altitudes to prevent um, uh, to inactivate the virus is probably not something I would rely on. I think the other thing to realize is, you know, sometimes the droplets that the virus can be in can provide some protection against UV irradiation. And so while I dearly hope for people who live in higher altitudes with more UV irradiation that they will be spared from such a severe uh, problem, I, I wouldn't count on it. And I think that's just because the dose of the dose of ultraviolet light, ultraviolet radiation required to inactivate the virus is higher than we would ordinarily experience just walking around outside. 
thank you. Another question about is about uh, eating garlic and ginger. Whether this can help us to prevent from getting an infection, and uh, it's especially uh, relevant about ginger because in Armenia the prices of ginger goes uh, they went very high. <laughs> so, to uh, this means that many people really believe that ginger might help to combat the infection. Would you comment on that? Well, the first thing I'll say is I like garlic and I like ginger, um, but I wouldn't rely on them to prevent me from getting sick, um, especially with, uh, with, with SARS-CoV-2. So I would encourage people to enjoy ginger and garlic in their food, but I would still re recommend that they maintain physical distancing wear a mask when they're in public and wash their hands frequently. I wouldn't count on garlic and ginger to shortcut any of those measures. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, next set of questions will be about the disease. Uh, so there are several reports suggesting that people who had BCG vaccination get milder forms of disease. What is the current evidence on that? So that's really is a fascinating question. And I spent much of my weekend discussing that topic with several colleagues. Um, the evidence so far, I think is not very convincing. It's hopeful. Um, and I think we need more rigorously designed and rigorously controlled studies to find out whether there's, whether there's protection from BCG. I think it's also important to distinguish BCG given earlier in life from so-called revaccination with BCG. I would be very skeptical of evidence that vaccination with BCG early in life will confer protection against SARS-CoV-2 in adolescents or adults partly because we know that the effects of BCG actually are short-lived. Now, that said, there is very intriguing scientific evidence that has emerged over the past few years that BCG can actually protect against infections other than tuberculosis. And that has really spawned a new discipline in immunology called trained immunity. And there is emerging scientific evidence that BCG vaccination induces a state of so-called trained immunity, and that trained immunity can actually protect against things that include viral infection. The important point to make is that trained immunity is short-lived. So in all of the studies that have been, so done, been done so far, trained immunity lasts maybe one year possibly can be detected after two years. And so while I think that there are intriguing leads that suggest that BCG revaccination could be beneficial, I think it's too early to tell that. I think it's something that should be studied rigorously because I think in, a, in an appropriate setting, a well-designed trial should give a result fairly quickly. In other words, if there were a randomized trial where let's say healthcare workers were revaccinated with BCG or not. And those healthcare workers that are exposed to a lot of people who have the infection, if there is a different frequency in the BCG revaccination recipients compared to the control group, that would be a very important finding because that could certainly provide some protection while we wait for a specific SARS-CoV-2 vaccine to be developed and, and distributed. Thank you. Since we talked about uh, potential risks for the healthcare workers, I would like to ask a question about uh, correlation between viral load and severity of the disease. There were some publications about this. If that is true, how would this translate into the practice, for example, for healthcare workers or for general public? Mm -hmm. So, I think we're familiar with a lot of infectious diseases where the viral load or the burden of whatever pathogen correlates 
with the severity of disease and with the likelihood of transmission. It's an imperfect correlation though, and it's something that we don't understand especially well. Um, I think probably the best understood is in the case of Ebola, where it was very, very clear that people who succumbed to Ebola were people who had the high risk viral loads in the blood. And it was also very clear that people were most likely to transmit Ebola when they had the highest viral loads in the blood. But other than that, we have a very difficult time quantitating um, a, a pathogen burden. We do similar, I mean, the, the precedent was really set with HIV, where we know that when the HIV viral burden is highest in the blood, that's when transmission of HIV was also highest risk. With other pathogens, it's less clear. There is a, a, there is a rough correlation. I think we can't dismiss the possibility that it's a, that is a correlation and, and that it's causal. There are two ways of thinking about why there might be a higher viral load. There might be a higher viral load because the exposure was higher. There might be a higher, higher viral load because that individual's immune response is less able to control viral replication and viral spread. And so I think we need to treat people at the height of their infection that have at least the highest burden of viral shedding with SARS-CoV-2. We need to be especially careful with them. Um, there is a phenomenon that applied with SARS-1, the so-called phenomenon of super spreaders. And that is not every individual was as likely to transmit the infection to other individuals. We're seeing evidence for super spreader events with COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 also. It's very difficult, unfortunately, to know what makes someone a super spreader. It may be related to their viral load. It may be to the volume of the respiratory secretions. It may do, it relate to the composition of the respiratory secretions. This is something that needs to be studied. It's a very real phenomenon. And hopefully we'll find out more about it. Um, but this is an important public health issue that, that we really need to understand better. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have uh, a question about uh, PCR testing and uh, an online attendee asks us that there is an evidence that the false negative testing in PCR ranges from 40 to 60 percent. Uh, are there any more uh, sensitive uh, methods, uh, for example, uh, helicase gene detection in the PCR to reduce this rate? Could you uh, comment on that? Sure. Um, so false negatives certainly happen with any diagnostic test, and they certainly are problematic because we don't like to say somebody doesn't have something when it turns out that they actually do. The false negative rates of 40 to 60 percent are higher than I'm familiar with. Um, I think that I've seen false negative rates up to in the range of about 20 percent. There are several reasons that can lead to a false negative test. First is the adequacy of the sample. In other words, you know, the PCR test really has to start with a healthcare worker swabbing the nose and mouth of the person under, uh, under investigation. Right now, we have so many new people doing that and what I mean by that is this pandemic has prompted us to have to have people without very much experience and without a whole lot of training obtaining those samples. Just because there are so many people that need to be tested, we can't have the well-trained people who, who are, are accustomed to doing that uh, sampling do it all. So there is some concern about the quality of the sample acquisition, and that can certainly be a variable. Um, next, the transport medium and the time between sampling and the time the PCR test is done can be another variable. The, the virus is fragile. 
um, you know, a little bit of detergent can actually inactivate the whole virus. Now, accidental contact with detergent isn't all that likely. Um, but my main point is the, the virus itself is actually fragile. It doesn't remain infectious or intact for a long, long time. And so the time between sampling and the time that the PCR test is done can certainly be um, a, a factor in terms of its sensitivity. And then finally, um, any diagnostic test, especially PCR tests, in the laboratory need to undergo quality control and every run needs to be assured that it generated a positive result with positive samples and a negative result with negative samples. And so different PCR platforms can vary a little bit in that regard. I think in the rush to report results, which is important to do, I think that some of that rigor has been relaxed a little bit and I think maybe when they, the most acute stage of this is subsiding, it'll be important to re-examine sort of what were the determinants of false positive and false negative uh, PCR tests. Uh, thank you. So uh, one of our attendees is asking question uh, about uh, why uh, the mortality rate between different countries is so different, why, why it is happening, uh, why the, the countries that have different measures or just have the same measures but uh, have different mortality rate uh, because of the COVID-19. That's a very important question and it's very important to understand that. So far, I've really only seen speculation um, and I haven't seen a the results of a systematic study. I think the, the, the data are just being accumulated. It's obviously potentially very, very complex. Surely some of the variation will have to do with the populations that are involved. In other words, if a population that is affected has other diseases, comorbidities that can contribute to mortality, then in that population, the mortality rate will be high. The availability of healthcare, including critical care, including mechanical ventilation, can be another determinant. In other words, in places where mechanical ventilators were in short supply, I think it's pretty clear that there were people who succumbed to COVID-19 that might not have succumbed if they had been able to had ventilator support. Right now, things are changing quickly. And so I think mortality rates in my monitoring gratifyingly seem to be lower than they were early on. I think that the mortality rate is still high. It's still unacceptably high. Um, some of the reasons for a decreasing mortality rate, I think, are that healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses, particularly in critical care situations, and also in emergency departments, are getting more experience in knowing how to provide supportive care. The other is the more we test, the larger the number of people that we detect. And so the, 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 the denominator is larger and so the number of deaths shrinks as a proportion as the denominator increases. If that's the case, then that isn't very encouraging. In other words, it just says that we were miscounting cases earlier and that we actually haven't made progress. Um, I think that the current data are probably a mixture of the two because I've seen evidence that even in places where testing became available, um, it didn't immediately account for a lower death rate. I mean, in other words, it, 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 if you adjust for the testing, then the death rate also was decreasing. So I suspect some of it is more knowledge of how to manage people. Some of it is the spread to places where mechanical ventilation is more, more available and um, that kind of supportive care can be provided. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I think that we can uh, proceed to the treatment, uh, to the questions that are relevant to the treatment of COVID-19. 
so we have some anecdotal evidence that the way COVID-19 affects the lungs does not, does not resume, resemble a typical viral pneumonia and widely used paradigm that every hospital in the world is preparing for, which is a treatment of acute respiratory distress syndrome, is not fully correct. Uh, instead, in COVID-19, the transfer of oxy oxygen by hemoglobin is damaged because of the virus. And what we see in CT scan images in lungs is not due to viral pneumonia, rather damage caused by pulmonary oxidative stress. In light of this evidence, what are the current treatment options that are available that interact with, new, with this new effective uh, with this new evidence, how effective are those treatment reg regimens? You already covered about hydrox hydroxychloroquine and azit azitromycin combination. Uh, but would you please elaborate on this and cover more uh, also about the hyperbaric oxygen treatment as well? Sure. So this is something very important, something that we discuss here practically every day. And that is our critical care physicians are really seeing something different than they've seen before. Um, but the data are only gradually emerging and it's a very difficult problem, obviously, because of the acuity of the problem and because of the severity of the problem. We can only learn, excuse me, um, we can only learn so much from autopsy studies because that's obviously where things have gone really, really wrong. We can learn some from monitoring levels of different disease markers, but a given disease marker that might be elevated might be secondary or it might be primary. And we don't really know in, in many cases what's coming first or what's contributing to the damage. There's certainly evidence for a hypercoagulable state and for sort of micro um, that might be contributing. That is a completely sort of novel mechanism in a viral disease. And so we're not really, not really sure how to best deal with that. So I think the most important thing with all of those unknowns is to try to contribute to studying and understanding things as well as possible. Um, I'll mention one particular mediator that's been discussed. So one observation is that interleukin-6 is elevated and is, is most elevated in the people with the most severe disease. We don't know if they have severe disease because of elevated interleukin-6 levels or whether interleukin-6 levels are because of their severe disease. I think we'll be able to know that because we have monoclonal antibodies that block the action of interleukin-6. If those studies show that blocking interleukin-6 in patients probably before they have the most severe disease, if that's successful, then that will identify interleukin-6 as one of the mediators of severe disease. A negative result, depending on how the study was designed, might not disprove it. In other words, if it's too late and the studies are only done in people that already have severe um, respiratory failure, then that doesn't disprove that interleukin-6 wasn't a contributor. Those results are beginning in a, var a variety of studies. Um, and so I think we should be able to learn some about that specific mechanism in the near future. Interleukin-6 has a lot of actions, and many of those actions are consistent with some of the clinical observations that, that have been made, but we won't know until a good trial is done. Um, and I'm afraid that our pace of discovering novel mechanisms is slower than, it, slower than we would like. So hopefully new treatments will become available based on what we can discover and learn in caring for severely ill and less severely ill patients. Uh, it's obviously in a tremendously frustrating situation right now for people on the front lines in particular. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I, I understand that we only have a suggestive evidence or a couple of case series reports about certain treatments, mm -hmm. but still many uh, people are wondering about uh, other treatment options, for example, about zinc in the treatment 
usage of uh, vitamins, administration of vitamin C uh, for the for the COVID nineteen patients. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any comments about this? So about so, effectiveness or sure. probably something being done in your clinic or. So each of these has a rationale. Um, in other words, I think that that you know what we see is disease and disease manifestations that, that can be attributable to oxidative stress and to oxidative damage and various other mechanisms. Um, these interventions are reasonable to consider. Um, so far, there is certainly no clear evidence for a beneficial effect of any of them. Um, I think it's, it, it's, a, it's a paradoxical situation that we have right now. In other words, at the time where we have the greatest need for studying these things, we have the least availability of resources and, and time and personnel able to, to do the studies. It's very difficult. Obviously, when your resources are devoted to just trying to save lives, it's difficult to have additional activity in designing randomized controlled studies and enrolling people and gathering the data and analyzing the data. So those studies, I think, have been delayed. They're rolling out here in the United States, in England, in other countries around the world where everybody is now confronting this problem. And so I think each of those deserves consideration. Um, and each of them should be considered in terms of their priority in, in well-controlled trials. Because I think without well-controlled trials, the only way that we could learn if something was successful is that if people given it were so dramatically positively affected that there would be no doubt that that agent had contributed to their improvement. Um, without that, we need controlled trials. If somebody finds that dramatic treatment, you know, it'll be clearly a miracle, miracle drug. And clearly the world will want to know about it quickly. And I have no doubt that the word will travel fast. Unfortunately, I'm not holding my breath or holding out for, for that to be developed in the near future, but we would all like it to be true. Okay, thank you. Uh, our uh, next question uh, is about uh, potential mutations of the coronavirus, new coronavirus and new strains. So one of our attendees uh, is asking that there are um, uh, some testing in Ireland revealed that, that there are about 14 mutations or new st other strains types of coronavirus. Considering this fact, how effect effective potential vaccine could be? So that is a very important question. And the, 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 the question is very appropriate. And there have been a large number of mutations in the range of 40 or so that have been detected. So far, there's no evidence that the mutations that have been discovered either correlate with severity of disease um, or with the efficiency of transmission. Not every mutation is beneficial to a virus. In other words, a virus like SARS-CoV-2 has the opportunity to make errors. In other words, genetic mistakes in, in copying the genetic code in their RNA. Um, SARS-CoV-2 actually is interesting in that it has a lower mutation rate than other RNA viruses like influenza. And there's a, a reason for that, and that is that the enzyme that copies SARS-CoV-2 RNA actually checks itself and, and has a proofreading capability, which is unusual for viral RNA polymerases. So the viral mutation rate isn't as high as it could be, but it is very real. And there are widespread efforts to track and to trace the various viral mutations. So far, the mutations main value has been in epidemiology. So for example, 
a group here at my university studied, I believe it was 29 isolates of SARS-CoV-2 from around the Bay Area. And what that showed by studying the mutations and showing what, what was common among some viruses and different in, in others, is that there were at least five separate introductions of SARS-CoV-2 into the San Francisco Bay Area because of genetic differences in the virus. We're all concerned about the virus ability to change um, and evade immunity and cause reinfection. So far, a, a bit of comfort, I think, can come that the mutations that have been detected in, in viral sequencing efforts haven't affected the so-called receptor binding domain of the spike protein, at least not at high frequency at all. And so what we would be worried about is that there's evidence that that, that domain of the glycoprotein of, of the spike protein should be a good target for antibodies. So far, there's not evidence that the mutations that are happening in the virus will affect that activity. Um, obviously, mutations generate viruses with new properties. For example, clearly the species jump from bats into humans involves some mutations. Um, and then those mutations happen to make the SARS-CoV-2 successful in, in humans. Mutations can be beneficial to the virus or can be detrimental to the virus. And so we're hoping that mutations that benefit the virus greatly by either making it more transmissible or by causing more severe disease, we hope that those are going to be rare and maybe non-existent. If you think about the virus's strategy in the context of evolution, a virus that kills people rapidly isn't a very successful virus because a virus that transmits easily and can cause more infections and can cause the virus to have more opportunities to, to make more of itself. That's actually evolutionarily the greatest benefit to a virus. And so I think that that's something that we need to be wary of. And I think that in a certain way, some of the changes, some of the variations between SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-1 have clearly made SARS-CoV-2 much more transmissible. Um, and so I think that that's what we have to be aware of and worry about. Uh, thank you. Since we are almost out of time, I would like uh, to ask you, what's, what is the final piece of advice you would like to give to the audience? You can respond, uh, respond in 13 seconds. Um, my advice is to continue physical distancing, wearing masks in public, and washing your hands frequently. I have a colleague whose email signature is wash your hands after reading this email. And I think that's a really good reminder that it's a good idea. So until we have something better, I think that's the best we can do. And that's my best recommendation. Thank you, Dr. Ernst. We are very grateful for, for the time and effort you took to share all your experiences and knowledge with us. Thank you for making this happen. This has been extremely valuable and interesting to all of us and your audience. Thank you for your questions and interest. Uh, now I will ask Astrid to wrap up the webinar and conclude it. Astrid, can you hear us? Yes, yeah. Dr. Ernst, Christina Jan, thank you very much. Uh, it was really very, very interesting and helpful. We will definitely continue a series of webinars about uh, healthcare aspects of defined universal fear. So you can watch the recordings of our webinars and follow the new ones through uh, the events calendar on our website, armenia2041.org. And the same you can find on our Facebook page at the crossroads. Thanks again to everyone for joining. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.
Maria.